Um, back to Ben Romick. Uh, any plans in the near future to uh, up the ABV of the core range from, I, I'm, I'm sure you were expecting this question. I don't know if you've uh, heard any of our conversations before, but the, the, the Gordon McPhail switched a lot of their previously bottled 43% uh, percent whiskeys to 46 and we're wondering if the core range will do the same for Ben Romick soon. Hey, welcome to Super Social Club. I'm Jeremy. This is Whiskey in the Six. I'm Rob. Welcome to the Whiskey Ramp podcast. It's a little crusty. It's frustrating. And it's going to be a little bit of a rant. I don't understand it. I don't know why. Some sort of injustice. Anyway, and rant. Hello, and welcome back to the Whiskey Ramp podcast. I'm Jeremy. I'm Rob. And tonight we have a very special guest with us from Gordon McPhail, Richard Urquhart's on the show. Richard, how are you tonight? I'm great. Um, thanks for having me on your show. So, yeah, um, great to be here. Um, it was about a year ago, almost to the day, Pretty much, that yeah, we met exactly. you in Vancouver, BC, and you gave us the absolute insane honor of trying the 80-year-old Glenn Levitt uh, Gordon McPhail bottling, which just absolutely blew our minds yeah. right out of the water. Um, for people that don't know, why don't you introduce yourself? What's your title, your relationship with Gordon McPhail? Yeah, so my name is Richard Urker. I'm a member of the fourth generation of the Urker family, the owners of Gordon McPhail, Ben Oak Distillery, and now the Cairn Distillery as well. Um, and my day job is head of sales for the Americas, so a lot of time over in the US and Canada. So but you have given us another incredible whiskey for us to try tonight. This Gordon McPhail, uh, the Mr. George Legacy First Edition, you gave us an amazing sample box Um with this why don't you just quickly describe what we have poured here yeah so the mr george series first came out um what would have been my grandfather's um 100th birthday he did mr george centenary and due to the success around that release and and due to the type of whiskey we we're releasing under mr george we decided to make it into a series so we've done edition one edition two and the editions will continue for a few more years after this year as well. So it's all very much just trying to commemorate my grandfather and his impact on single malt whiskey. He was um, known for keeping the amber light of single malt whiskey alive in the 1960s and very earlier when the whole world had their head turned towards blend. So this is very much a series of blend grand bottlings, all to commemorate um, Mr. George, as we called him. So this one in particular is from 1953. It is bottled at 59.4% wow. alcohol by volume. How, like, what serendipitous aging allows for such, an, such a high ABV in an old whiskey? So what was done to where we store the cast, but also the cast themselves. And this is where Golden Fail really kind of comes into its own in terms of our wood policy and our wood management. We have matured whiskies longer as the whiskey we tried last year than most other companies in the world. So we have matured whiskey up to 80 years old, and that probably won't be the oldest whiskey that we've achieved. But we do know how to look at the distillery character, the age we're trying to lay down whiskey for, and make sure we get the, the right balance we're looking for there. So with some of these old Glen Grant casks, Glen Grant was, was one of my um, grandfather's favorite distilleries. So the Mr. George series will always be um, Glen Grant's um, up until maybe one of the final releases we do, but that'll be a few years before we can tell you about that one. <laughs> but yeah, so going back to um, the whiskey itself, a sherry but European oak, you can see the color coming through there is dark, it's rich, and it's not lost a huge amount of strength. Um, this one may have been filled at a slightly higher strength than 63.5, which is more common now. Um, but even at that age and that strength, it's still perfectly balanced. Speak to the distillate of something like Glen Grant um, that can withstand age. Because I know we've had some whiskeys. I mean, you see some older bottlings of some stuff with distillers like Glen Grant or Mortlock or McAllen. And what is it about that distillate that lets it age so well for so many years? So I think distillery characters evolved decade by decade. So distillery characters, they, so we're not talking about quality here. We're talking about the actual character has, has changed in space side. Uh, we know that with our distillery, but Ork, when we made that older style. But back in the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of these space out distilleries in our local area were making quite full bodied, heavy spirits. And they have stood the test of time. I mean, we have matured old Linkwoods, old Mortlicks, old McAllen's, old Glen Grants, and they've all still come out 
um, well balanced and great for their age, even after, in some cases, such a, a well, this one is 67 years old, so it's a youngster. It's not like the 80 <laughs> we tried last year. It's a little younger. <laughs> Um, the nose on this is out of control good. Um, do you want to even try to describe what you're getting on this? So you're like, you, which what the most like the most shocking thing about the nose on this whiskey is how fresh the red fruits you get yeah. on the nose. Like it's just like this beautiful bouquet of like raspberries and and ripe ripe strawberries and and that kind of which is shocking because like you said, it's, it's 67 years old, but we shouldn't be too shocked because that 80 year old that we did try last year was remarkably fresh for its, yeah. for its age. I think that's one thing that really blew us away about that 80 year old, as well as this one is how vibrant it is on the nose. And you're not getting just dusty old Oak. You're getting right. so much fresh and, and really just vibrant fruit notes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a difference between this cask and the cask we used for the eight-year-old. So this is a European oak um, sherry bud. So whereas the eight-year-old is actually in an American oak transportation sherry bud. Right. So we are getting out. So this whiskey probably wouldn't go to 80 years old because the cask would start to, the balance would fade away and it just start to be overpowered um, by the wood. So for what I love about these old Glen Grants from the 50s, I've had the privilege of trying many different casks and bottlings we've done over the last kind of, uh, last decade. And it's this kind of really kind of sweet candied fruit character you get coming through. Yeah, you get a bit of polish, a bit of raisin coming through there as well. And it's just um, one of my favorite um, kind of whiskeys to enjoy is some of these old Glen Grants. And we're very fortunate that Mr. George had a big love, passion and love for that distillery that we have good stocks for whiskeys from Glen Grant going back to then. Like this is just, I'm getting those like really nice like tea notes too, that like yeah. really fruity tea note um, that, that you, you really, get with older whiskeys. I was going to say right? that you really only get that with older whiskeys. Um, I mean, we've had some experience with Glenn Grant's, um, some older things too, you know, 30, yeah. 30 years, 30 plus, but this is just next level. Yeah. This is absurdly rich. Just like it, when we first cracked these little bottles, the aroma filled the room and yeah. that's only that's only yeah. ever happened to me a couple of times and it was with full bottles so i was absolutely shocked right. that yeah that, that it, happened it usually like happens when something's like insanely peated but this is just insanely fruit forward and yeah. amazing yeah legs are insane as well like it, it, it's like glued to the glass <laughs> so richard tell us about like the cast selections and the process that you guys go through at gordon mcphail when you have a huge warehouse of stuff and how often are you trying this? How often do you go to these things and open them up and just get to the right point where you're like, this needs to be bottled right now? Yeah, so I mean, when we look at our cast selection, we grade our casts out of 10. And our whiskey supply team and operations um, is looked after by my twin brother these days. So he learned from our current managing director, Ewan McIntosh, who learned from my uncle, who learned from my grandfather, who learned from my great grandfather. So that knowledge about cast selection has been passed down um to through the generations um to where we are today and my brother is already starting to pass knowledge on to the, the team that, that he works with so when we do a mr george release he wants it to be a nine out of ten trying to explain his kind of grading scale is um a five is a good whiskey but that doesn't sound very good if you try and sell oh this whiskey's a five right so but that is what that means it's it does what it says it should be that's a, that's an okay whiskey to be a Goldman Field bottling, it probably needs to be higher, six or seven. To be a single cast bottling, it needs to be a bit higher again. And to be a Mr. George release, it needs to be a nine out of 10. My brother um, has never given a 10 out of 10 to any whiskey yet. I think that's because he's always still searching to find that perfect whiskey. He may never find it. Maybe he'll find it on his last day before he retires, but he's always looking for. And he always talk about what is the best representation of that distillery. Because every distillery has got a different character. So we use different types of casts to match to those types of spirits and different lengths of maturation. So we're always looking for that kind of what we call that balance between spirit, oak, and time, and making sure we can offer, well, a great whiskey no matter what the age. So that's why if we do a 67-year-old or an 80-year-old, the quality of what we release has to be there. It's not just about the age statement, it's about that, about having that balance. 
I mean, I'm just living in this nose right now. Yeah, like, the nose is incredible. Richard, paint us a picture. What does it look like at the Gordon McPhail warehouse? Like, how were the casts organized? Do you have them in category of age or distillery? Or <laughs> what does it look like when you walk in there? Um, I might be to change my background if you give me a second and actually let you see yeah, what it looks like. Yeah, look. yeah for okay. sure. I mean, what a job that is to, you know, have the accessibility to Gordon McPhail. Because, like... I don't know. Like I've been told that you guys maybe have some of the most broadest selection of casks yeah, in your like, warehouse, maybe in all of Scotland. Well, what we found interesting is some some information that we stumbled upon that in a lot of compared to a lot of distilleries or using a lot of other distilleries casks, you actually have older whiskey than they have at their own distillery of their stuff. The oldest whiskey. So there's a key point here. So. Coleman Fields um, kind of process is not to buy mature whiskey or buy casks from distilleries. It's actually to fill our own cask at distilleries. So the Glenlivet 1940, that was a cask filled by my great grandfather and grandfather, a cask we had sourced from Spain. We bottled, we transported sherry across Scotland, bottled the sherry, and took that cask to Glenlivet and filled it. So for us, it's always about filling our own casks. So we can do that whole kind of, the whole maturation is done under Gormick Fail. Mm -hmm. That allows us to control the consistency and the quality of not only what we have today, but what we will have in the future as well. So that's an idea in the background there of what the cask organization is like. Yeah, so the, this is our, one of our warehouses in Elgin, so just next to our head office, we've got a racked warehouse and we've got a small Dunnish warehouse there. And it's, this, this picture shows that we have kind of nine decades worth of whiskey maturing right now. I think it's going to go, yeah, nine decades. So not only 1930s, but 1940s all the way up to the 2020s. So, so that nine, I've been traveling a lot. So yeah, <laughs> nine decades worth of, of whiskey coming through there. And we have this range of over, around about 100 distilleries maturing in our ownership and some of the oldest and I think probably the oldest whiskeys and casks in the world. And this is the great thing about Gormick Fail because it's all about putting more whiskey back in than we take out, laying down more spirits, so future generations will have access to the same kind of stock profile, hopefully, and, and probably a greater stock profile than what we have today. Can you speak to like how many barrels we're talking? Like what's the, what's the scale? Do you know how many barrels are currently aging in the warehouses? Yeah, so I think it, it varies depending on when we bottle when we got cast coming back in. But I'd probably say we've got roughly about 18,000 common fill casks. We probably about 20,000 Benoma casks. Um, and we now have some Cairn casks coming in there as well. And this is probably the, the big thing for us in the future. If we were ha having this call back in the early 2000s, we'd have probably around about that 18,000 casks in total. So we've expanded the number of casks that we have. If we're sitting here in 10 years time and having a, a, another chat, and we'll have 100,000 casks across the three parts of our business. Wow. And this is very much our, our investment for the future. We know that if we invest in in casks to get the right quality wood, put good quality spirit um, into those casks, we will um, have really great whiskies in the future as well. So Gordon and Mc... Ben Romick is, uh, you guys are building a new distillery for Ben Romick, or is it just a warehouse for Ben Romick? No, it's a brand new distillery. It's called the Cairn. So we have three parts of our business just to kind of uh, to go back with that. So go and fill the home of single malt whiskey, effectively. Bottling single malt whiskeys. I think you mentioned they were bottling whiskeys longer than some of the series have. I think we have stock that's older than most what most series have of their own single malts. Yeah. We have my grandfather's dream. So Mr. Links into Mr. George. Uh, my grandfather always dreamed that one day we'd make whiskey ourselves. And that became a reality in 1993 when we bought Ben Omerk and we reopened that distillery in 1998, a hundred years after it first opened. Wow. But we, always, we, we always joke with Richard that. Or sorry, with uh, with James that uh, that that Gordon McPhail has more Brora than Diageo has. Yeah. Do you think is that true? Do you think that's true? I think that'd be one task, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't let some of the sales guys like myself know exactly what we've got in there, just to make sure um, we keep stocks back. But and then, but then, in a couple of years ago, we decided that we we're going to build a brand new distillery. So this is a distillery called the Cairn. It's on the River Spey, um, in a town called it's outside Granton. Um, you've got the Kengo Mountains just behind there. And it's a distillery that's very much more kind of modern than what Benomic is. 
So Ben talks about old school tradition, making whiskey the way it was made in Speyside. Everything's done by hand and is crafted by Keith Krugshank, our distillery manager, and his team of distillers that they work there. The new distillery is built today for tomorrow. Modern architecture uses, uses technology. We try and make it as kind of sustainable as possible. And we're making a, yeah, a, a modern space out there rather than do what we do at Ben Ormark. And when, but, when do you expect uh, that whiskey to go to market? So the, we're looking about 12 years down the road now. So okay. I think it's going to be a while before we can um, release a whiskey. But we do have a visitor center open there now as well. And we do have a range of single malts, sorry, a blended malts you can try when you come and see us in the style of whiskey that we believe we're making out of the distillery. So you can try a 12-year-old, an 18-year-old, 25-year-old, a 30-year-old, oh, cool. but even come and try a 70-year-old, which is um, Jeez. which is something that hopefully um, that's the way the whiskey will turn out in 70 years' time. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, well, let's talk about quickly. You just took a sip of that. No, no, I just took it. I've been oh, okay. sorry. I should I should say I've been sipping the um, the Linkwood 15. This is the Gordon McPhail Linkwood 15 that has been around for many years, uh, but recently changed to 46 percent. So I I've been sipping yeah. that to like kind of prep my palate for this beast. Next yeah. Year. So like Linkwood. So this is a good a good point because like isn't gordon mcphail kind of known for taking you know malts and bottling them that were kind of just maybe in the blending market back in the day so i think if you go back in time to the 1890s where we opened in 1895 distilleries would produce spirit they would sell it the spirit to blenders who would create their house blends and some of those blends are the most famous whiskeys in the world like chivas regal johnny walker um and Goldman Trail did the same type of, um, had his own house malts as well. But we also decided that we'd want to bottle whiskey a single malt. Everyone thought we were kind of crazy for doing that because there was no added value. The whole world wanted blended whiskeys and we were offering single malts. But it meant that we could offer something that was unique. So we were approaching series like Linkwood, Glenlivet, McAllen, Mortlick, and buying their spirits and then not bottling it under as a blend under our name, where bottling as a single malt. And that's where some of these labels come from. So that is Linkwood's original label from over 100 years ago. Wow. And that was what we were given to use when we wanted to bottle a single malt. So it was a, a nice way. We came effectively a licensed bottler for these distilleries and offered to the markets at a time when there was very little single malt available. Um, we want to talk about Ben Romick real quick because yeah, we should. There's been a lot of buzz about this distillery in recently um, by us as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the been the first to say. Well, we weren't the first to say. We found out we weren't the first to say, but we... so it's been coined the Spring Bank of the North. The Spring Bank of the North, yeah, um, or, or at least of Space Side. Spring Bank of Space Side. So, a lot of good things from this distillery right now. Um, you know, we are really loving the cast strength bottlings. Yeah, this is um, fantastic. This one here was selected. This is the, oh, this is the vintage this is the, 2010. This is the 2010, yeah. Amazing stuff. Just unbelievably good. Um, ben Romick in general, which obviously there's a rebranding that happened not too long ago. Where's the focus of this distillery going right now? So it's all about old school space sites. So it's that elegant, fruity, slightly smoky character. You can taste in the, in the cast strength are 10, 15, and 21 year olds. So, using our knowledge of how whiskey and space side has changed over the decades, um, we've gone back to create a spirit style, which is more in line with having your own full maltings when you've been using a little bit of peat and drying your barley. And that's very much the focus. Of it. It's really kind of handcrafted. I know that's an overused term, but it literally is made by, made by hand using the skills of other stores and making this kind of more traditional old school space I'd spirit. Yeah, so um, James and I are hoping to collaborate uh, with you at some point on a, a single cask pick of the Ben Romick. Hopefully that happens in the near future. Um, was he, we were debating whether to do a Gordon McPhail or a Ben Romick, but I think, uh, you know, the, the way Ben Romick is, you know, just hitting our palate lately, I, I really think that Ben Romick was the right choice. So James has already been on the phone about that. And we are definitely looking at what options we can present to you. Um, awesome. So we'll come back to your range, um, a selection of casts for you to have a look at. Yeah. 
Um, fantastic. I just took a sip of this. Did you? It is like so impactful on the palate. I don't think I've ever had that before. It's like, it's like the whiskey just held my tongue and wouldn't let it go. It's insanely viscous. Uh, the finish lasts forever. This is, this is amazing. You've, you've got to be pretty proud about this bottling. This is out of control good. I think this is the really nice thing about our family business. Um, we get to work with these liquids and these casts that we've been passed down through generations. So we bottle these whiskeys, uh, but they weren't laid down by ours. They were laid down by previous generations. So we get a nice thing to work with spirits from previous, my great grandfather, my grandfather, my dad, my uncles, my aunt, and everybody else that's involved in the business. But we get to take credit for their work as well, yeah. at least into the market. <laughs> hey, you knew when to bottle it. So that's half. That's, that's, that's a big question. Yeah. 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 So when you have the right cast in the warehouse, it makes your job a lot, a lot easier for, sure. for in our view. So, but then we also have the responsibility to make sure someone else can be sitting here in 30, 40, 67 years' time talking about whiskeys that we've laid down today. Yeah, so our cool. active filling program across our distilleries and Gomer Trail, we all laid down whiskeys to be another 80-year-old in 80 years' time. Maybe even laid down whiskey today to be even older than that in 90 years' time. And we are working on a very long-term kind of filling plan to make sure that these whiskeys and offering the market these greatly aged whiskeys isn't just something that we do just now, it's something that we can continue for generations to come. Yeah, I love that. Build the legacy and keep it going forever. I mean, that's that's what, uh, yeah. we describe ourselves as custodians. So we take the business on from generation before us and we try to keep everything going and build in and make it stronger and then pass on to the next generation who will hopefully continue to do the same. So uh, this summer I went to Bahamas and we went to a, a place called Bahamar and then there's a portion of Baja Mar that's like outside of my affordability range. And it's called Sandalwood, I believe, or something of that sort. And there was this like incredible aroma, like just sprayed throughout the entire building. It just smelled luxurious. And like the combination of nose and palate on this is like bringing me back to that spot. It's just unbelievable. Like, aromatic like uh like a like sweet sandalwood yeah. tea notes yeah and, like just like some crazy stuff going on the here. tea and the floral aspects coming in with this now even like like coffee um just so much stuff going on with this it's so hard to describe it's i mean i've never had like this i don't have enough Glenn Grant experience to be like, this is a Glenn Grant profile. It doesn't drink like Glenn Grant really that I've experienced before. I mean, I think when you get to this age category, it's not going it, to, I mean, it's going to be very hard to get that like the di distillery characteristic, I guess. Yeah. Richard, can you speak to that? Like, to, does this Glenn Grant read Gr Glenn Grant to you? Like, do you find the characteristic of the distillery in this? Yeah. So if I try Glenn Grant's 1950s, you get a very distinctive kind of flavor profile coming through there. And that is, okay, so the distillery character is maybe less than it would be if it was 10 years old. Right. But the consistency we get in our Glen Grants in the 50s demonstrate it's not just the wood, it's the distillery character that's there as well. Yeah. Where would I mean, you over time, you kind of get character. Or if you're looking at a graph, you've got character and you've got time. The distillery character will come down over time and cast influence will go up. So we're using the right cast right at the time to attain that kind of slurry character. It won't be 50-50, it'll be it, but you'll still get to taste that slurry character in there. I mean, for us, it wouldn't be worth releasing whiskey if, it, if we felt it wasn't the right quality, no matter what age it was. But the other thing to think about with this whiskey here, in 1953, there must be, there can be a huge amount of 1953 casks left in the world. Right, yeah. yeah. So not and only are you gonna try something 67 years old, and we can make more 67 year old whiskey in 67 years time. Right. <laughs> but we can't go back in time and make more or fill more casts from 1953. So it is finite, it is unique, it is scarce. And that is something that we can um that is something that Goldman Phil can offer off the world is these access to try these whiskeys from from the past. I, I don't know how I go back to anything else after this. Like it's just yeah. It, the, what's what's so sad about trying whiskeys like this is that like 
immediately we're back to reality and <laughs> not able to replace that taste ever again for a very very long time but like we've never had a bad bottling of anything the gourmet fails put out like we're a big no. fan of the yeah. cast drink series the Connor series like everything we've had is good like you guys have a rating system what happens like is there even a cast that falls below where you would be like we we can't bottle this under our name then it goes into a blender like what happens to whiskeys that don't meet expectations so we don't do any blends anymore. So that's something that we stopped a few, a few years ago. I think in 20, about 2018 is when we did our last kind of blends. Um, so using our cast policy and our wood policy, and my brother and Steve will create our casks and they'll check they're maturing the way they are. If a cask isn't maturing the way we expect, we can always give it more time. That's one thing we can do. We can just say, you know what, that cask needs more time before we feel it's ready to bottle. If something isn't going the way we expect, and time won't fix it, we can move it into another cast to give it some more time to then increase or to get to where we expect it to be. But we're very fortunate the cast that we filled today, we're working with three or well, two bodegas in Harath and one Cooperage um, to get our sherry casts. We, we get them made to our specification. We get them seasoned with all the Russell sherry we, for at least kind of our sherry hogsheads are at least two years and our sherry bots at least three years. We then bring them back to Scotland. So we get very consistent cherry casks because we are specifying exactly what we're getting so that means we do all get the consistency we're looking for in, in those whiskies most of the casks which are older than say 10 15 years old we know what quality they are already they've been checked they've been they're on a journey that we're kind of mapping out so we do obviously check them and depending on the strength and where they are on that journey they'll get checked more often and then if we feel it's not going to progress and get any better, we will always kind of bottle it and leave it in glass until we want to release it. Is after all the whiskeys that you've tried out of, we'll we'll stick to Gordon McPhail. Um, what what is where does this rank in your all time favorite list? So that's almost the impossible question to ask because <laughs> it's about where I am, who I'm with, and the experience that goes along with it. So I think it's. Um, it's about really enjoying the experience when you get the chance to try these whiskeys. I mean, for, I've been incredibly fortunate to try a lot of our older whiskeys and share them with um, with consumers and and whiskey fans all around the world. And it is just a this amazing experience to try and try these older liquids. So, yeah. as Jeremy was speaking to earlier, we've tried a lot of Gordon McPhail, and I've tried to compose a list of my top 50 whiskeys of all time. And recently I put out um, my top 10 and Gordon McPhail are one and two on that list. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the funny part is, is if you look at my top 50, they're appearing more than any other company, distillery, whiskey, yeah. associate, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they are all over that list. Mm -hmm. So what you guys have done, even just as long as we've been fans of whiskey, have been has been phenomenal. Yeah, it's been incredible. So something with our wood policy and the way we fill our casks is every cask we fill is destined to be a single malt bottling. That means we have to make sure it's the right quality that we can do single cask bottlings. It has to be. It's always so. I think that's really helps us when our strategy now is to do a lot more of these kind of cost of choice single casts or private collections that each one is this kind of um this unique offering um but we probably do really small whiskies in terms of expressions in most companies so that's probably another reason why so many whiskies feature in your in your top 50 just mm -hmm. about the volume of releases that we do these days which is hundreds of single casts that go around the world is there distilleries that are more willing to sell their distillate? Are there some distilleries that refuse to? We have a lot of bottlings from you guys from Kalila, um, from Kleinleash, Morlock, Morlock yeah. Linkwood. Are those distilleries more like, you know, we'll sell our, our spirit over and ever? Are there some distilleries that won't? So we don't fill out the same number of distilleries that we used to. That's part of the reason why we have two distilleries now, because we can see a trend forming and it will change the business over not over my lifetime but but the next generation probably beyond that so we don't get to work at every distillery or fill casks at every distillery but we do work with we still work with more well, diageo for more like liquid kalila and a number of distilleries there but 
part of that is down to our long-standing relationships with these with these companies and with these distilleries. If we started our business today, it'd be very hard for us to try and go out and get fillings at any distillery because we wouldn't have that reputation or that well, there wouldn't be that faith in Goldman Field that we're going to release these amazing single malts. Mm-hmm. Do you find that just more distilleries are keeping all their distillate for themselves just because whiskey is selling that much better now than maybe it was before? I think it's to do with um, multiple factors. One is capacity. One is brands. Distilleries are brands now. They are, and they want to control their brands. We are the same with Ben Oak, So, I mean, we can completely understand why some distilleries don't want other whiskey, other whiskey bottlers to um to to release their whiskey yeah but for us we will always try and film the series that will that we can for um for going film and I'm, I'm just in awe i know this whiskey. I, 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 I actually my... feel bad because <laughs> although this is coming from your this your uh company it's it's not uh you're not sipping it with us tonight so i actually <laughs> almost feel bad but uh, it is absolutely fantastic. Now, is this cask um, aged in your Dunnage warehouse? Um, so this would have been potentially, I wouldn't know exact location of the warehouse, but it would have been matured in Elgin last week for the last couple of decades at least. And um, all the old whiskeys with casks we have are in the, the warehouse, which is next door to the one that you can see behind me. Nice. <laughs> I mean... So where do you call home? Uh, closer to... Gordon McPhail or Ben Romick, or are they very close to each other? I say exactly halfway between both of them. <laughs> I couldn't pick a favorite, so I had to, I had to get a house that was ten minutes from me, from the, from Elgin and ten minutes from Forest. Walking distance, good call. Yeah, <laughs> not quite walking distance, ten minute driving. So <laughs> these, these older casks allow you guys to do something that pretty much nobody else in the industry right now is doing, uh, which is on a regular basis, releasing really, really old whiskey. Um, McAllen recently bottled an 81 year old. Um, is, is that common? Like, do you think that they still have stuff that's older, what older than what you guys have? Or uh, do you guys know if they source that, through someone else or anything of that sort? Um, I think it's, um, there will be other old casks in the in series warehouses. We don't actually get a huge amount of sight of what they have there. I'm pretty confident that the casks that we have are probably the oldest casks in, in the world now, but that's just what, what I think we have without actually going around and checking everybody else's warehouses. So for us, I mean, it's, we do work with the series and it's always relationship based and and for us, it's, um, yeah, we do have a lot of old whiskey from distilleries and, and we do try and, well, we try and get to the market in the best best way we can. And a follow-up question to that, did McAllen bottle the 81 just to spite Gordon McPhail? No, I think it would be completely, I think it'd be interesting if we hadn't done the eight-year-old, would they have done an eight-year-old or an 81-year-old? <laughs> um, but you know what, the market, I mean, McAllen is an amazing brand. They are and um, pushing the boundaries of single malt whiskey and yeah it was good to see another whiskey come out that was not well we weren't quite the same age but i'm pretty close <laughs> <laughs> will gordon mcphail be coming with an 82 year old next year <laughs> um we are on a journey towards a hundred year old whiskey we've yeah, got exactly. cast identified in our warehouse that we think ca- could go to a hundred years um and that is something that we will see watch these casts see how they mature see the qualities still there see if the um it's gonna if it can actually take that age but that would be something that yeah yeah base to a hundred year old whiskey yeah they're yeah well i mean i i think in that case you guys should win because i mean i i don't know obviously how many people could actually do it i think the only other ones that could possibly do it are the ones that have been producing i I don't know i guess who would who would it be it would possibly be uh, glenn livett maybe Bullmore. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, you Gordon, have to go back in time a little bit and see what the strategy was 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Right. And if it was a blend strategy, holding back with physical malt probably wasn't the highest priority. Right. True. That's, that's where we get a lot of our kind of 
our strength in our portfolio is that we were always filling casts to be single malt. We were always pushing the boundaries of age to see what we could get to. And that is why, and this is probably one of our greatest strengths in terms of trying to mature whiskey to even the older ages is we don't just have one cask maturing. We've got a choice of casks. So it's not like there's one cask in the warehouse that may get to 100. We've got a few more on that to yeah. have the potential to get there. So that's so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit here, um, back to Ben Romick. Uh, any plans in the near future to uh, up the ABV of the core range from, I, I'm, I'm sure you were expecting this question. I don't know if you've uh, heard any of our conversations before, but the, the, the Gordon McPhail switched a lot of their previously bottled 43% uh, percent whiskeys to 46 and we're wondering if the core range will do the same for Ben Romick soon. Well, there's two different kind of um, points there. So I'll come back to Gordon McPhail and do the Ben Romick one first. Is, um, we make award-winning liquid. Everything we enter, Ben Romick into, it picks up really big awards and we're really happy with the flavor profile. And so for the core range, 10, 15 and 21, there's no plans at the moment to change the ABV because we're very happy with the style and the quality of the liquid that we're producing. But we do understand there is a market out there for higher ABVs. That's why we do the cast strength offerings. That's why we do smaller batches under our contrasts, which are all 46% and non-chill filtered and we do single cast bottlings as well. So the core range, we feel we've got it, we've got it right in terms of what we're releasing, but we do understand, yeah, other releases will be more attracted to other parts of the market. So that's why we do the contrast range and those other bottlings. Any, any plans to do uh, a 25 year old, for example, of the uh, Ben Romick? Like I know recently uh, receiving incredible awards was the Ben Romick 40 year old, which I'm saving up my pennies. Uh, <laughs> hopefully one day I can uh, pick up a bottle, but, uh, and that was castring, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Any plans to do a 25 or something in like in that kind of range? Um, not as a core release right now. Um, Typically with the kind of strategy, doing a 10, 15, 21, it'd be 10, 15, 21, 30. If you did a 12, 18, then it'd be a 25 if you were staggering your portfolio. We want to make sure there's enough gap in the in the age that you're actually getting a different flavor profile coming through. I'm not sure by going 21 to 25, we'd see enough variance right now to for that to, to really add to the portfolio. But we might come out with some 25-year-old single casks, you know, as we'll have some whiskey i'm sure they'll come out because the scenery will be will be 25 years since we restart production next year wow. since we restart production that's very cool yeah yeah it's a, that's actually a great point that you brought up there um there are plenty of distilleries i find that are probably bottling uh whiskeys too close in age where you don't quite see the benefit from going from one of the younger ones to the older ones whereas the gap that you guys have formed seems like it's appropriate for that kind of growth um, in taste anyway. So we will always have a gap in our portfolio from the oldest whiskeys we have just now in our warehouse would be 24 years that we've distilled ourselves. But we do have older casks, which were filled um, before the series closed in 1983. So the series was silent from 1983 to 1998. So there's a 15 year gap there. And that's where the four shield stock comes from. So that's part of our heritage range. So this distillery that we didn't distill, it's either casts we bought with the distillery, and in some cases it's casts that we used to fill under Goldman Fill as well. So those are currently coming out as a, a batch release really, of cast strength. So roughly about a thousand bottles. Uh, the 2021 edition won best in show at the San Francisco Wine and Spirits competition this year. The 2022 edition has been very well received as well. And we'll have other releases that come out um, from that. But we are working with finite stock. I guess in hindsight, if we had known we were going to buy Ben Romick in the future, we should have filled more casks on the Gormick Trail when we had access to it um, back in those days. Good point. Yeah. 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 You, official bottlings. Yeah. Essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you did ask about the link within the distillery labels going to 46%. These are very small batches that are produced from these. It's not thousands of cases a year, it's hundreds of cases. And that is aimed at a slightly more, um, there's a bit more of a specialist market. So using cast selection, we can actually retain the balance and make sure we're often by quality. And we did raise, raise the ABV. That was a change that came in through COVID. And it's, it's one that I think really 
does work for that range. And you'll see that in all of the two labels going forward. Um, it makes it non-show filtered. It's it's more that kind of fits in that kind of GNM side of it quite well. That means we only offer one range under Goldman Frill, which is non-show filtered, which is our discovery range, which is a range of like 11, <coughs> sorry, and 13 year old whiskeys um, from distillers like Kalila, Glenn Rothis, Glenn Grant. Do you see a change in consumer like um, tendencies of going to higher ABV whiskeys? Do you see that selling more in certain markets or is there still the largest whiskey markets you guys sell in, they still prefer maybe a little lower, more approachable ABV, like a 40 or 43? I think you've got a fact, there's a bit of context on this, that the size of business that we are, there's consumers that want lower strengths and higher strengths, but we're not trying to sell millions of casks. It's quite low numbers. I mean, Canada is a market that has been growing for us year on year. We've got great partners in the market, like James and the Authentic team are, are doing an amazing job and we're seeing great growth at Ben Omicron, our core range in the market. We've also seen lots of single casts coming into the market as well. And I think there is probably an increasing market for these kind of unique single casts that once they're gone, they're gone. A couple hundred bottles, maybe a hundred bottles, maybe in some cases only 60 bottles. And then we're seeing that coming through there as well. But I think every market is is different. I spent a lot of time traveling around um, Asia before, um, before COVID. And there was definitely a tendency more for high strength, cash strength whiskeys there. And I probably see in the US as an example that there's a mixture of both everyday whiskeys at 43%, 46%. But this again, there's still a growing market for um, single cask, cash strength offerings. Mm -hmm. This this whiskey is out of control. My last sip of that was all it was ridiculously like raisiny like sweetness mm -hmm. but then it was coffee yeah. and there was like cocoa kind of notes to it um that that like steeped tea kind of note like um like a black tea kind of note uh just what a beautiful whiskey what a fantastic um you know every time i drink a gordon mcfield i know i'm drinking something excellent but the last few that we were <laughs> Uh, we had the luxury of trying were absolutely phenomenal and really like hard to re replicate these experiences. Like it, it's and, once in a lifetime. And I'm incredibly jealous right now because I would never ever get to try that whiskey again in my entire life. Because <laughs> it's all it's all sold. It's all so, yeah. different countries on the world. Um, we have no more. I've got no more sample packs that I'm aware of to try that whiskey. And so that will be a whiskey that. I have tried before and it's and it's it's amazing. And I'll have to look to the next one that comes out next year and hopefully that will be um I'm sure it will be equally as good as that one. But it'll be different though. It won't be exactly the same. Right. Yeah. Well, you have spoiled us yet again and given us such a huge honor to be able to try these, you know, moments in time. Uh, they're really just like a piece of history uh, in a glass, which is really cool to us. And you know, that's why we love whiskey. Um yeah, when, just, when I started this channel, well, Whiskey in the Six, uh, you know, we, we started the Whiskey Rant a little bit later after uh, Jeremy started his channel, Sipper Social Club. Um, but if you would have told me before I started the channel that there would be a time where we'd be trying an 80-year-old Gordon McPhail and then an, another, uh, what do we say this was? A 67, 67. 67 years old um i would have a mere mere youngster of a whiskey <laughs> right yeah yeah um i would have laughed i would have yeah you know been like sure. okay I, I you know well because those, not delusional the 80 year old didn't even exist right it didn't, exactly it didn't exist exactly. in the world but, but this is what we can do at goma Phil, is we can showcase products from so many different distilleries and let everyone try something that's different a key thing about what we do is about complementing distillery offerings not competing so we do do different maturations, different ages. A lot of our whiskeys, which are really old, there's limited kind of distillery offerings available. Um, so yeah, so complementing and offering these older whiskeys is definitely a big part of what Gorman Phil does. So many cool things coming out of Gordon and McPhail right now. Um, can you speak to maybe like one, you know, bottling that's on the horizon that we can expect to maybe see that's maybe a little more wide reaching uh, that you are excited about? Yeah, well, it's hard to imagine this one, but probably one of our biggest releases this year was our Milton 1949. Mm. And this is a whiskey 
from a distillery that changed its name in the early 50s. So it never actually released single malt under the name Milton. So it changed its name back to Trithyla. I think it was yeah, either 1950 or 1951. And we actually tried to buy that distillery, but it went bankrupt as well at that time. And my great grandfather and grandfather went there, it went to an auction. And I believe we were the second last bidder in the auction and we lost out to, to Shivers Brothers. Um, so you still want it today. So that whiskey there, I mean, you get to try a cask from a distillery that's no longer called Milton. You never released whiskey under that name, Milton. And again, it's another young server whiskey at 72 years old. Oh. So that is, I mean, that that is something that we can never recreate in the future. We'll never have another Milton cask ever because we don't feel there. And unless the distillery changes its name back to Milton, they won't have one either. So that was an incredibly exciting and, and really kind of a great kind of whiskey story for Goldman Trail. We just launched our closest distilleries as well, the Re Recollection series. So that's a, <coughs> a collection of whiskies which are from distilleries which are no longer um, in production. And that will be something that we probably repeat next year and the year after and the year after and the year after um, until we run out of closed distilleries. So, so that's a very exciting one as well. And then we're going to have a, a Benoma coming out under Gormick Fail as well. Um, which is something that we've not done for quite a long time. And that is one that we could probably tell you more about in kind of Q1 next year. But that'll be um, exciting to see a Gormick Fail whiskey coming out. And if you factor in what Gormick Fail stands for about complementing, not competing with distillery offerings, it's not going to be a standard maturation that's the same as what we do. It's not taking a 40 year old cask for Ben Omerk and just sticking it in the Gormick Fail bottle. It's going to be a different maturation coming through there. So that'll be a, a I'm quite excited to see that one coming to market as well. I mean, you have the dream job. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously your family. And let's talk about real quick the, the picture behind us. This is the original Gordon McPhail grocery store. That's how it all started, right? Yeah. So back in 1895, when Gordon McPhail opened, we had one part of the bottom, the ground floor of that shop. In the first kind of first year of trading, my great grandfather John Urquhart joined the business, and then he worked his way up the business to be junior partner, then senior partner, and then in 1915 was sole owner. So you can actually see John Urquhart in the middle there. He's the one in the center with the bowler hat and the bike, um, right there, yeah. And he was the one that kind of bought the business, so he started the kind of family's kind of journey with Gorman Trail. I, I quite often get asked, why didn't we change the name to John Urquhart and Son or something different? And by that point, the, the business had been operating in, in his hometown of Elwyn for 20 years. It had an established name. So I think he, the name was retained just because it was a local business that had a name that was recognized. And that's why um, it's been owned by the Urquhart family for over 100 years, but it still retains that name, Gordon Trail. Really cool. Very cool. But over the years, we've expanded, so we don't have one section of that shop now. We have the whole shop. And it is a, you can go there and you can get some kind of great whiskey experiences and, and the team there look after you and you get to do flights of whiskeys and get to learn all about Gormick Trail and our, and our history. But there is one point about the shop that might be worth mentioning. You can't quite see the, the windows above the, above the shop there, but those are all kind of offices which were rented by distilleries. So if you go up to the top floor, you look at these old kind of offices. Um, I used to, the business used to be run out there um, completely up until the early 1990s. So it was a place that I would um, spend a lot of my childhood when my dad was working. And all these offices have letterboxes on them. And that was because the distilleries would rent them and they'd be their town office for banking and other kind of administration. And that's probably how we started to build relationships because we had distillers in, in the same building as we were. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that'd be a place to visit. Right. Yeah. Love the one day. One day we'll 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 meet you there, Richard. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, if we do manage to get you across and get get you up to see us, it would be um amazing to show you the three parts of the business. So, start and see how single malt whiskey was brought to the market a hundred years ago through Golden Trail and the, and our kind of house of single malt whiskey. Go to Ben Oak and see how old school space side whiskey is made. See how every valve is turned by hand. See Keith and his team um, actually turn every valve, do everything without any automation at all. And then let's go to the Cairn, see a modern distillery, work our way through it, and end up at our kind of whiskey tasting room overlooking the River Spey, 
the Cairngorm Mountains behind um, and drink some whiskies that are in a style that we can't um, try for another 12, 18, 70 years in the future. That sounds like an incredible trip. I think I'm available July 1st. Yeah, it's like, uh, <laughs> how does next weekend sound? You, you available? <laughs> um, I, I think after three weeks of traveling, I'm going to have a weekend off this weekend. So. <laughs> but, the, but the weekend after is fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, obviously a dream trip for us um, to witness and see that stuff would be so cool. So, yeah, so cool. Absolutely. Uh, well, Richard, you have honored us yet again we are forever grateful Absolutely. and forever in your debt for experiencing these amazing whiskeys um yeah we can't say thank you enough i mean just uh, mind blown how good absolutely how good this stuff is. it was incredible and, um, and thank you so much for having me on here and uh, and let me talk about my family or whiskeys and the only downside was i wish i kept the sample packs so i could have shared the whiskey with you because <laughs> as i said Incredibly jealous that, but that means that I am drinking one of my favorite whiskeys, which is Ben Oak 15. So yeah. our 15 whiskey is uh, probably the, one of the family favorite whiskeys that we have in our portfolio. And um, so it's it's not bad for a consolation draft. <laughs> All right, Richard. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I mean, yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. It's been awesome. Really, really. That was great. Good. Thank you for having me and and Slange, and enjoy the whiskey. Cheers. Thank, thank you so much. Do you, do you know the the Canadian connection to Benwick? Have you heard this one before? No. no. So Sean Hobbs, so the, the, the company that owns Authentic, um, is owned by Duncan Hobbs. His uncle, Joseph Hobbs, used to own Benwick just in the 1930s, hmm. along with Ben Nevis and Glen Lockie. Um, so it's not the only reason why we've seen great success in Canada, but um, it's nice we're working with a company that has a connection to, to our distillery, because it used to be their distillery. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah.